So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's last session. Uh, the speaker is uh, Li Ting, who is a PhD student in Netherlands. Uh, she studied research uh, related to machine learning and disease. Uh, the topic will be, oh, it's different from <laughs> phrase. Okay, the cytogenetics in cancer evolution. Uh, let's welcome her. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, since I changed the topic a little bit, so if can you hear me or not? No. Hi. Oh, got it. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. And uh, since I changed the topic a little bit, so. If you feel uncomfortable with this topic or it's not as you expected, you might go to the other holes. <laughs> but I will start with a short introduction and if you still feel like it's not your type of talk, you can still leave, I don't, I don't mind. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about phylogene phylogenetics in cancer evolution and using Python to do data visualization and machine learning. And I am Li Ting Chen, and I'm from Taiwan. And today I'm giving the talk in English because I thought there would be some English speakers and then it would be nice to have some English talks. But um, bear with me, and if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me. And the question can be in Mandarin or uh, English, is both fine. So I'm the first year, uh, first year PhD student in UMC Utrecht in the Netherlands. And I did my previous study in Taiwan, and I moved to the Netherlands since two years ago to do a master in bioinformatics. And as some of you might know, I used to be a vet, and then I st switched my career like one and a half years ago to bioinformatics. So um, yeah, so I'm interested in human and animal health, and also in Python, and that's why I'm here. Um, and since I am still kind of new, um, so if you found that uh, the following talks is not as you expected, please bear with me. Um, so I would like to know actually why are you interested in this talk? So if you have anything to talk, just press your mic and tell me so I can have a general idea. Any hands? Okay, no. So let's do it this way. Uh, are you interested in health, health science? Okay, then you can stay. Um, are you interested in cancer? Oh, no. <laughs> no one's interested in cancer. Okay, yeah. So this will be, um, since the background of, since my background is a little bit different from the general crowd here, I can believe. So I will spend some time on introducing the topic itself and then less time on the machine learning and the visualization part, if that's fine. Yeah, and there are other talks also <laughs> in English. Um, so I would like to first talk about why would you care about cancer genomics? So what is cancer genomics? Um, Biomedical sciences is a study of, from the very uh, basic structure of cells, and then all these come together, form a complex system as human or animals. And today the talk will be focusing on the DNA level, which is, which is called genomics. And a little bit more introduction on genomics that genome is the code of life. As if like Python language is the code of all the software you wrote, or part, uh, kind, one kind of the component of the software you wrote. Uh, genome is the DNA double helix that is the code for life. And it is a large, uh, it's a combination of A, T, G, C, four different bases, like binary zero and one in a mathematical code. And there are a lot of bases in a human cell. 
like more than this. And in every cell, the genome, in every individual, the genome is different. So your genome is different from the genome of the people who sit next to you. However, in every, every cell in your body, it is also a little bit different from each other that is caused by a random mutation joining the cell replicate. So we're interested in sequencing the genome of, your, of yourself. So every one of us has a different genome, which causes us to look different. We have different diseases. And the cause of sequencing a genome is going down rapidly since 2000. So you can see that the first ever human genome is sequenced in 2002. It's being finished in 2002, which takes around, I think, 10 years of time to build up. And then the second one is come four years later. And then now you can simply sequence your own genome in 200 euros. Um, $200, which is a rapid change. And you can also see that the genomic data in the world has accumulated very quickly. So you can see there on the Y scale is a log scale. And since the first genome being sequenced, now there's, uh, in 2011, there's like a thousand genome being sequenced. And then now it's like going up like this. So that's why I'm interested in this topic. And that's why also I'm trying to give this talk to raise the awareness in, um, in health science and then how, as a, as a data scientist or as a software engineer, how do we see this um, problem or this opportunity? Yeah. And there are major uh, big companies are also getting interested in this topic, and those are such as Google, Google Cloud team, and Google has a Google Genomics team also, and there are DNA Nexus from Alphabet, Microsoft, and there's also a famous like personalized sequencing um, service called 23andMe. So there are more and more companies trying to enter this field. However, there are still many like. Mm, privacy issues that need to be dealt with. And that, that was the introduction part, which was long, I know. And now I'm going to enter with my project. So as, as shown on the topic page, I guess many of you might not know what is phylogenetics. And I will explain in the next slide. But I'm sure you know cancer and evolution, which is almost um, will help you understand the phylogenetic. So this is a typical uh, cancer evolution. You can see that from the very beginning, a normal cell was there, and maybe the cell is not replicating, or it is replicating, but it's um, splitting in the normal speed, and they also die in a normal speed. However, turning over time, since you are zero years old till 30 years old, every time it replicates, the DNA might start with some random mutations. Sometimes it might hit the position that are not important, which will not change your genotype at all. However, if it hits on a gene that is very important to the cell cycle or to the health of the cell, then the cancer might start. And with several mutations uh, add together, the cell might start to replicate without control, and then that's um, caused, a not, caused more mutation to happen during the uh, expanding period. So you can see, I'm going to shout. Uh, so you can see from here, maybe there was one mutation that the very important for the cell cycle to become irregular. And then because it replicates quickly than before, uh, more mutation may happen in the process of growing. And different mutations will happen in different clones. 
in the end, you will end up with a tumor, tumor clone that is uh, heterogeneous. Um, which means all the cells in one tumor might have different genetic background. Okay, till now, who, I, who are still following? Super! Okay, that's getting more and more complicated. But in the end, I will come back to the code, so, uh, <laughs> so you can wait a bit. <laughs> yeah, so in this, um, so this project I did for my master project, uh, I will explain a little bit about the experimental setup, which is um, we have an in vitro cultural, a cultural which is like culture of cells in the plate. But as I explained earlier, it's a tumor culture. So all the cells uh, represent the tumor in our body and they have different genetic backgrounds. So um, we see it's only a plate full of cells. We don't know what is the genetic background in it, but we sequence over time and then we can see the population. Um, how does the population varies? in different time points and how, how does the evolution change. So for example, here you can see that the blue, corn, uh, blue clone in the beginning is small and then at one point it gets a critical mutation and then it takes over the population, something like that. So from this uh, bulk, uh, from this sequencing of several time points of single cells, we want to build uh, mutation tree on the right, you can see. So different mutations uh, were acquired throughout time, and then what the data we got <laughs> is this, this, so all the different cells with different mutations. So we want to use this like a snapshot data to build a tree that represents the biology. There's my problem. That's what you want to say, right? Okay. Sorry. How do I start this? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay. So as I said, we sequence single cells, which costs a lot of money, but that gets us to see what is the difference between cells. Because um, in before, you always sequence tumor clone as a mixture and then you don't see the variation between cells. But now we can see that, oh, we can see that um, within the double-stranded DNA, um, in, in the gray dots, you can see that it represents two N. As I uh, say in the very beginning, that uh, each of our cells has double-stranded DNA in two copies. And then you can see in the blue, which is the uh, uh, the deletion of a segment of a uh, genome. Okay, I think I'm lost, losing a bit of you. Uh, I will uh, explain it again. So here are five different cells. And uh, from here to here is the combination of 23 um, chromosomes you have in your cell. So this is the whole genome in your cell. And then if you see the gray part, then it, is, it means that in this cell, there is two chromosomes in this position, which is normal. And then if it's blue, then it means that like during a replication, the cell has lost one of its chromosomes. And then in red, you can see that uh, they have one more chromosome. And this is, the data points are generated in, by a single cell da data, so which is very sparse, and if the during the processing, any part of these DNA is not sequenced, then you lose the data. So that is also one part of the difficulty in uh, biomedical bioinformatics, that the data is sparse and it has uh, internal errors. And here you can see that um, this is a simple heat map of um, of the single nucleotide variation in the, these cells. And you can see that in most of the positions we, got, we sequenced, it is uh, absent of 
mutation, while the red dots in, the, in here are the information we want to get. So the whole study is trying to get around like the 2% of total data we got that is informative. Therefore, um, we developed a sparse distance calculation that helped us to solve this problem. I don't know if um, any of you in other field that will, feel, that will face like um, data table that is super sparse, that is hard to do any like clustering or um, machine learning on. I think most, mostly you will try to impute the data first before you can do anything. And this is um, try to represent the distance between sparse data before imputing. So you can see uh, this module is developed by our colleague and we can uh, capture the clustering while main maintain, uh, we can maintain the clustering while having like 30% of missing data or even up to 50% of missing data, you can still see the similar pattern as in um, no missing data. And I, why I'm trying to say this is that Python uh, really helped in uh, translating natural language into code. That is um, by simple like importing NumPy, then mo it did most of the job. And here you can see the code snippet of this program and it's also on GitHub. Um, we first calculate the similarity between cells and then calculate the dissimilarity between cells and then add them together, which generate uh, this um, cluster map. And then with this cluster map, we, we have the dendrogram that represents the distance between cells, which represents the cancer heterogeneity in our sample data. And that we are interested in how does it look exactly in each of the single cells. And here is the clustering. So on top is the dendrogram that is tracked from the previous graph. That is the sparse distance between cells, between 900 single cells that you get. And then um, on the y-axis, here is the different um, SMV position, which is the mutation position in the chromosome. So you can see that by clustering, we can see that one part of the cells that have a mutation in these positions, and the others has around there, but between different cells, there are also different mutation you can see. And then from this, we want to build a phylogenetic tree to find the relationship between these cells and who are closer to each other and then who are the daughter of the other. So this is a, um, a small machine learning algorithm I applied to this uh, question which is we use a random forest classifier to determine um, if one cell, uh, if one mutation acquired after the other, then you can see that um, first, if it's acquired, then it's one. And if it's not, it is zero. So it is only possible from zero to one. It's not possible to have the first mutation and then get back to normal. So that from this ordering, we can uh, develop a, a pairwise distance, uh, pairwise ordering. And then from a pairwise ordering, we uh, impute the genotype metric and then do this as an interactive process. And here is a, how would you train a random forest with the iterative uh, updating data. And then after this, we want to use the pairwise ordering to draw a network and then from the network draw a tree, most probable tree that represents the phylogenetic tree. And here I, I'm showcasing a, a plot that is generated by 
both network X uh, combined with matplotlib. So first you get the ordering from the network X uh, module, and then from this um, structure, you put that into matplotlib and get the coordinates and then plot the other layer of data on top of each node. So here you can see that um, different clones having different kind of copy number variation. And then the daughter clones only contains the, sorry, the, the daughter clones only contains the subclones of the, their mother clones. So it's kind of uh, make, makes sense. <laughs> Okay, and this is a code snippet for adding the pie chart to each node. I, I found that um, re really cool. <laughs> and here is a, another, another uh, visualization that is developed by a colleague. So this plot, it's generated uh, automatically by matplotlib combined with Net network X also. So uh, here you can see that what we input is uh, the clone size of each time point and each clone number. And then when the tree is generated, you can try to swap all these um, different size of node and then try to fit them together without crossing. Because this, this problem might not seem difficult, but actually if you want to automatically automatically generate a phylogenetic tree with a size representing the cell count is um, not so simple. <laughs> so yeah, so, and then with the background of the tree that represents the cell size, uh, the clone size, you can plot whatever other data on top of it. So in this graph, it shows a multi-layer um, data information. So the first layer is that copy number variation is used to build a tree. And then on top of it, we plot another uh, information that we acquire from single cells that is like the cell barcode we introduced uh, during, uh, in the very beginning of the experiment that is a viral barcode. So you can for sure know that this cell is uh, if two cells are containing the same viral barcode, they are from the same clone. So here you can see that in the subclone sub -clone of clone 5, they are both having the uh, pink barcode. And then the, barcode, uh, the clone 2 and 3 have both the blue, blue barcode that is not present in the other clone. And this is also open sourced. Uh, um, they uh, open source code that you can try to play with. So in summary, um, why, why am I here? Why, why do I want to talk in a Python conference? Uh, that's mostly because I am really thankful of Python that uh, allows us as a like, beginner who start coding with Python language easy to pick up and then start to really do something that uh, helped me finish my job. And Python is uh, very useful for me in machine learning application and then quick, quick implementation of mathematical con concepts. And then uh, it's also a powerful visualization tool. And here is a team who's, who work on this project to together. And um, uh, this slide shows a little part of my toolbox that are presented in this um, talk. And in the end, uh, I would like to thank everyone who, who are sitting here. Thank you for contributing to all the open source projects that enables uh, us as a scientist easy to start working without building from scratch. And um, I think uh, research for health is for healthcare is for everyone. And I hope that this is a reciprocal process that software engineer develop their time into uh, building some tools that helps health, healthcare 
researcher that do research, and then in the end, it also helps everyone for uh, enhancing global healthcare. And what I see in the nowadays is that uh, as as a healthcare researcher, we're really trying to work toward programming that is really helpful. However, we don't have the skill set that enable us to do whatever we want. So if it's possible that uh, more programming people would like to join the, um, the field of healthcare, that would be super cool. And in the end, we thank, thank again to PyCon Taiwan 2019 to have this wonderful place to, for everyone to gather together here. And I really enjoyed it. And thank you for your attention. Right, thanks for leading this presentation. Uh, there is no Q&A from Sire though, so if there's any question you want to ask here, uh, just uh, raise your hand. Oh, Hi. please, just uh, push the button in front of you. Okay, first, thanks, thanks for your excellent presentation. And uh, in one of your slides, I noticed that you plot the dendrogram. Yep. And that means you use the hierarchical clustering, right? So may I ask, uh, what is, what is the distance method uh, and the linkage method you used? And how do you justify the result? Is that result, is the cluster, sorry, is, is the clustering result matches your, uh, your expectation? Yeah. How do you judge that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, let me go back to the slide. So I think you are asking like, how do I plot the dendrograms, right? In, in this, right? In this um, figure, it is generated by Seaborn. And in Seaborn, there are many different uh, uh, built-in clustering methods. However, this one is, is not the, one of the built-in method. It is the, exactly the distance we try to develop by, um, in this code that is uh, trying to uh, calculate the distance between uh, sparse data, which is, which is not possible with all the built-in um, distance method in uh, Seaborn. And if you are asking like the height of the dendrogram, then it is not very informative in this case. And uh, the second question was, how do you justify it if it's true? Yeah. And um, so the problem is with uh, biological data, you don't have a true data set that um, we cannot really see the cell replicate from each other under microscope to make sure who is the daughter of who. So what we did is we have several layers of different information. I didn't explain it early or uh, clear, clear enough, but we have like introduced viral barcode that is a small, small fragment of DNA. And that is um, kind of like uh, manually introduced. So it's, it's like a real data, real, real, uh, real proof that, that says that the, these two uh, should cluster together. And then that you can see on the color bar on top here. So the purple one should belong to the same um, barcode. Oh, uh, so, oh sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. But uh, this is another layer of data that is called copy number clone. And then um, that is, yeah, it is a, a, another layer that you can see that the clustering represents the color bar, which are separate data. It's a two different data set. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, more questions coming? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Uh, hello. Oh, oh, great talk. Uh, I'm also the, uh, in the field of bioinformatics, and I'm curious, and uh, here, if you, uh, you 
made the random forest here, and what's the purpose of you taking this method, and what's the prediction label you used in the random forest method? Okay. Uh, can you repeat the second question? Uh, the label you want, uh, the target you want to predict. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, frankly speaking, random forest classifier is the first choice I did. And it kind of works, so I stay with it. Um, and the uh, labels I put in there is that I want to predict um, between all these, all these uh, SMV sites, which one happened before, each, before which one. So for each pair from one, two, one, three, one, four, I, I have a label that um, uh, one before two is, the label is one before two or two before one, or they are not related. So that was the label. And also, as, the, as I mentioned before, that we don't have true data sets, and how do I get the training data? We, we wrote a simulation, simulation um, program that generate a simulated uh, cancer evolution tree. So we, get, we train on the simulated data and then apply it on the real data. And the uh, future we work we would like to do is that we want to get a real data set that is like a uh, true observe from real cancer evolution instead of simulated data and then train on it. Right. Oh. Okay, here's one more question from Chairman. <laughs> Hello, hello. As a software developer, I don't, f I can't follow your uh, topic very much, but I think it's very interesting. So if I would like to know more about it, is there any place for me to follow up, like an open space section, something? Oh, <laughs> that would be a nice idea. I will think about it. And yeah, if I, there is an open space session, welcome to join. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sounds a really good promotion of open space. <laughs> so yeah, um, tomorrow afternoon we will have open space. So if every, anyone have any topic, please just uh, raise it and uh, be there and raise your group. Uh, thanks for leading this presentation again. Please give her the applause.